grace to you and peace in the name of God, who is our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. It is my joy to proclaim that whoever you love, you are welcome here. Whatever your gender, identity, or expression, you are welcome here. Whatever your race or ethnicity, you are welcome here. If your pockets feel full or empty, if your heart feels full or empty, if you came today on fire with faith or if you came tiptoeing over wondering if you really belong, come and know the love of God which is for all people. Come and know the love of God which binds us together as a community and sends us out to show love and courage to an aching world. Come and let us be the church together. If you are new or reconnecting to this community today, well, hello and welcome. We are so glad to worship together. If you're feeling brave at some point in time and would like to fill out a new visitor card is available in the video description. And through that, you can sign up for our emails and we'd be happy to reach out to you just to get to know you a little bit better as well. Today is a communion Sunday. And so it is the belief of this church that all are welcome at Christ's table. You are invited to bring whatever you have to break and to bless. So bread or tortilla or cracker or juice or wine or water, whatever you have, it will be enough and in fact will be holy. We are so glad to gather together around this sacred table today. Following worship, we have a Zoom coffee hour where you can chat with folks and today we have the special treat where Nancy Bent and Saskia Orr are going to share their quarantine hobby of playing and learning the recorder. So I think it'll be a lot of fun. I hope you can join us. If you need the link to that Zoom coffee hour, uh, please feel free to reach out to the administrators of this page. And finally, I have a pastoral note. Uh, it is with sadness that I let you know of the passing of Le Leroy Olson at the age of 100 years. Leroy has been connected to this congregation for years and years, all the way back to the Little White Church. He has, is a incredible storyteller, a person that uh, loved genealogy and would tell incredible stories from his life. He leaves behind his light, wife, Vera, of 77 years. And so we hold Vera and all who loved Leroy in our prayers today. And so let us have a moment to breathe be still as we prepare for worship today. Let me open my hand. Let me open my heart. Let me open my have an idea, a vision that comes to you of some aspect of creation before you, and then when you actually start to try to make it, you realize it's not going to look like a vision at all. Come as we learn to work with one another, with the messiness of reality, to learn how to be co-creators who love creation. Come, let us worship our God. Oh. 
Please be with me in a spirit of prayer. God of creation, we marvel at your presence and give thanks for all of the ways we are invited to recognize you in our lives. We give thanks for the opportunities afforded us as we imagine and live into our partnership as your co-creators in this world. We thank you for the times when we are convinced that we see the truth of life, the times when we are sure that we can walk a straight line to its door. And we also thank you for the times when we struggle to recognize the truth, when a fog clouds our vision of it, for the willingness that we have to seek your guidance in these times. Thank you for your patience in these times of confusion. Enable us to stay by our plan of reaching out to you to avoid the imprisonment of habits that restrict us to just one point of view. We pray today especially for those in our midst facing health challenges those who contemplate their last moments and days of this life, those who grieve the loss of life, and those who celebrate its quality and longevity. We pray for an end to injustice. We pray that you will bless us with your grace as we seek to bring peace, love, truth and justice to all of your creation. We thank you for hearing our prayers, attentive, loving, and gracious God. We offer our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen.
Genesis 2, verses 4 through 9. On the day the Lord God made earth and sky, before any wild plants appeared on the earth, and before any field crops grew, because the Lord God hadn't yet sent rain on the earth, and there was still no human being to farm the fertile land, though a stream rose from the earth and watered all of the fertile land, the Lord God formed the human from the topsoil of the fertile land and blew life's breath into his nostrils. The human came to life. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and put there the human he had formed. In the fertile land, the Lord God grew every beautiful tree with edible fruit, and also he grew the tree of life in the middle of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and of evil. Hi, this is Beautiful City from God's Bell, which I'm filming in my yard from the Kingston Suquamish area. Yes, we can. 
beautiful city, not a city of angels, but finally a city of man. I used to, when it was particularly bad and sometimes still, I used to write about three sermons a week. And before you get too impressed about this, I'm not saying that I finished three sermons a week. <laughs> what it meant was this. It meant that I would read the scripture and the commentaries and then in the midst I'd have this image of inspiration, imagining what the sermon would be. And in my mind, and especially as long as it stayed in his mind, it would connect the scripture and an image and where people were in faith, and it would be just a great idea. Until I started writing. <laughs> because on its own, first it would just stay there shining, clearly being exactly what needed to be preached this week. And the moment I started writing those words, I saw it diminish before my eyes. As it changed from this beautiful, limitless potential to my own awkward sentences. Great ideas falling flat, all the possibilities and nuances turning into a series of paragraphs with their glaring errors. And I realized that this great idea might actually be impossible to put down on black type on a white screen. It was nothing like I thought it would be. And so, this is what I would do. I, I would start over. I'd go back to the text. I'd see it from a different direction and a different potential and possibility. And then I would begin to write. And it would happen again as this beautiful possibility became not. <laughs> as metaphors become obvious, jokes become hokey, theological insight suddenly it looks very like trite pat latitudes. I would say, well, what if I start over? <laughs> because as you can imagine, you could continue in this process for a long time. Or at least I can. Because the potential of the vision of what something could be and the work of actually creating something that exists in the world has a lot of contrast. As possibility meets the limits of the actual concrete creation, and you might even call it the fall. <laughs> You might hear folks talk about creation in the Bible, but there are actually two different creation stories that are a part of our, of our scripture and tradition. And the first goes very orderly day by day where God said, let there be, and then it was through all of the creation of the world through the orderly seventh day of rest. And then it's done. The whole world is created. And if you're just reading the text, it seems kind of like it all starts over. It tells another story of creation. This being the story of God and the garden, creating humanity out of dirt. And if the first story is, is very orderly, the second is zany. <laughs> as God tries to make this first human a companion out of every creature on earth. 
imagine picturing a human and saying, this person needs someone to be their best bud and making an aardvark. <laughs> Until finally, a companion is made out of the same stuff. As we get our first genders of man and woman and talking snakes and apples and getting thrown from the garden and so on. Historical scholars look at this text and they say this sounds like two different stories, two different origin stories next to each other. And if the first begins with chaos and continues one day at a time, this one is instead in fits and starts. And it tempts at creatures that are delightful but don't quite hit the mark. And the story of the fruit that should not be eaten and being cast from the garden. That last part, as in much Christian tradition, is called the fall. When compared to how God created us to be, we screwed up and somehow it is never the same. And thinking on this, I think there are ways that I can be tempted to look at the difference between the inspiration, the possibility, the idea, and what is made. I can be tempted to be stuck in the disappointment. And the contrast to be one and the other. In the feeling that it's something that's broken in us that makes the things that we make broken. The ancient Greeks in particular felt the contrast between the ideal and the actual in its place which mirrors in some ways the contrast between the mind and the body. When you think of the things that we can think of that are ideal, the ideal chair or circle or world of justice or life, but then there's the ones that are before us, which are real and which are messy. Even now, as we are imagining the world that we will be making together on the other side of this last year, and when you start thinking about the realities, it can be exhausting. Because the nitty grittier of when do we wear masks and how do we navigate the new social worlds and how do we create a world with more racial equity. Or how do we create virtual experiences and hybrid experiences all at the same time? If you try to imagine it, you can feel the contrast between the ideal that we are going to make a whole new world and the reality <sighs> that it's messy and complicated and hard. That's based in this world where our bodies are feeling the strains of this last year and years. And so I would like to offer a different interpretation. It's actually, you know, these stories of Eden, they don't show much in the Hebrew scriptures at all just in the New Testament. And most of the time there are ways that maybe we could imagine this story differently. Maybe what we think happens in creation, what happens when the idea becomes material, maybe instead of it being a fall from grace or a fall into flesh and blood or paper, <laughs> Instead of that part of the story, we look instead to beginning. When God gets God's metaphorical hands in the mud. 
Writer Annie Dillard shares what she calls a fairly sober version of what happens in the small room between the writer and the work itself. It's similar to what happens between a painter and a canvas. First, you shape the vision of what this projected art will be. She names the vision I stress is no marvelous thing. It's a chip of the mind, a pleasing intellectual object. It's a glowing thing, a blurred thing of beauty. Its structure is at once luminous and translucent. You can see the world through it. But are, you are wrong to think that the actual writing or in the actual painting, you are filling in the vision. You cannot fill the vision. You cannot even begin bring the vision to light. The vision is not so much destroyed exactly as it is by the time that you have finished forgotten. It has been replaced by this changeling, this opaque, lightless, chunkly work. Probably by now you have been forced to toss the most essential part of the vision but this is a concern for mere nostalgia now. For before your eyes and stealing your heart is the fighting, frail, finished, entirely opaque project. I love this being open to the opaqueness of the thing that is created. The art, the structure, the invention, the world, loving the mud, loving the body and its imperfections, loving creation, not in contrast to the vision or inspiration, but because the created is a different and beautiful thing all of its own. I know that Sometimes people imagine inspiration happening with someone sitting under a tree and calling Eureka. And there are ways that the spirit of God can be at work in that initial inspiration, mysticism. But so it is too that we can imagine God at work in the physical. We see God here in this story with God's hands in the mud. Where God is making a creature because the garden needs someone to care for it. that the vision and the physicality come together and come together then with the breath. And it takes this mud and changes it into something more. How would it feel to imagine that God is not, not disappointed in who we are, but delights in God's creation. Is not disappointed that we can't be everything, but is delighted in who we are and wants to participate in creating who we will become. That God has a vision of a world of justice and love transformed in abundance for all. And Perhaps you think you are called to build a shining city on a hill, but instead what we might be called to is this mud right here. This complicated community where we will live with our present and past. It takes some of the weight off to say each one of us, any one of us, doesn't need to be the one person given the shining vision of perfection and asked to bring it to light, but instead 
that God is here with us in the mud and from us is creating hard community conversations or coalition building or yard cleanup that we could be invited to look with love upon our flat sentences on a page or our lumpy bread as it rises, our first prototype, our frustratingly incremental changes, but sometimes if you look, you can see the thing you love that is beautiful because it is embodied. When it takes a step into the real, then it is molded into something that can be in relationship with the world and one another because God created humanity from the dirt and the mud and breathed life into it. And so it was mud with life. There is a beauty in being that is all its own in creation in our call to serve, in our own work of creation. Because I still do sometimes write too many drafts. But through this act, I have also learned to trust. Because when it comes time to preach these words that sometimes just seem dead to me on the page. <laughs> that when we are in community together, I feel a hint of that breath. A breath of God that connects us to one another and to calls us into a world that isn't just an ideal by and by. But the act of creation in the here and now that can use bread and juice and heck, fishy crackers, whatever it is that we have, the physical world before us, that that too can be transformed with God's hands in hope and in life. May we be ready to get our hands messy in the beautiful, imperfect, transforming and transformed world. Amen.
As we come into this time of communion, as we approach a table where all are welcome, I invite you to remember a time when you entered our sanctuary or an auditorium somewhere only to discover there were but a few open seats, where you see more heads and bodies than empty chairs, or where only the, own, the first row has open seats. Maybe you've been in a place where there were plenty of open seats, but they were all located in the center of long rows where you would have to climb over each individual body to get to your seat. But maybe, just maybe, you have had the wonderful experience of walking into a room where there were indeed plenty of seats and someone who already had a seat at the table, so to speak, pointed their finger to the open seat next to them and invited you to join them, to sit next to them. This is a clear gesture of inclusivity, a clear, explicit invitation. The Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown, lead pastor at Plymouth Church in Seattle, spoke these words of inclusion at a gathering yesterday afternoon. Those who are seeking to be included should never have to draft their own invitation. They shouldn't have to assume that their invitation is implicit. And those who are already at the table should not assume that those who are coming will simply blend in. With every person coming, there should be the acknowledgement that it it is a new group and that the onus falls on the existing group to make space. We are to leave a space with the awareness that more people will come. We're invited to not see it as an offense if those coming do not see the table as enough or with sufficient resources. Today's invitation is to an open table of celebration, a table of communion, where we gather to experience the presence of Christ in community. We gather to hold the memory of Jesus' life and ministry, to anticipate the promise of that which is not yet realized. As we prepare to approach and gather at this open table today, may we be reminded that while an open table is constantly changing with new faces, beliefs, customs, and practices gathering around it, its constant ingredient is one of love embodied by the life, practice, and sacrifice of Jesus. This table reminds us of the last meal Jesus shared with his disciples, where on the night that Jesus was to be betrayed, he took the bread and giving thanks for it, he blessed it. He broke it and he offered it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. And as often as you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup and giving thanks for it, he blessed it. He offered it to his disciples saying, this is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. Gracious God, we give you thanks for these elements. We ask 
that you bless them. Bless them in our service to you. Bless them as you give us strength to be your presence in an unjust and aching world. Be with us in this time of communion as we remember your life, as we celebrate your resurrection. We give thanks for this opportunity to remember you and to reflect upon our many gifts and blessings. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, for all things are ready. Justice and joy, compassion. 
of God be with you in the worlds in which you live. May you be nurtured by the time of gathering and be faithful in the time apart and love and serve one another in the name of the faithful God who calls us to the beautiful and messy work of creation. May the peace of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer be with us all the days of our life. Amen. Amen.